Well, I just want to welcome everyone here to Embrace at all five of our campuses. My name is Adam. I'm one of the pastors here. And as always, we're so glad that you're here, especially if you're joining us for one of your first few times. We are thrilled that you have joined us today. And now I honestly cannot believe it, but we are just a few days away from Christmas, which means that it is officially crunch time for us guys who most likely have not bought a single thing yet for anyone. And as males, it's possible we didn't even know that Christmas was coming up this week, even though it's been on the same day every single year for a long, long time. But again, it is Christmas time. And this year we've been looking at the Christmas story found in the book of John. And in John chapter 1 verse 14, it just says that God became flesh and he made his home among us. Once more, God became flesh. He became human. God became one of us. We've maybe heard that a baby named Jesus shows up and it goes on to say that he made his home, that he decided to live, that he decided to dwell again, that he made his home among us. Us. You see, regardless of what we might feel or believe about God, our God, he actually isn't a far off distant God. And we don't need to climb a tall ladder to get to him either. Instead, each Christmas, we're reminded that through this baby, that through Jesus, God, he comes to us and he makes his home among us. Now, I believe I was in eighth grade the year my family and I, along with a buddy, we took a family trip out to Denver. My parents owned a small hardware store at the time, and I think there was a trade show they were going to, and so we decided to make a family trip out of it. But we got to our hotel, which was located in downtown Denver, and it was incredible. The place was awesome. And well, I pretty much thought that anything better than a Super 8 was amazing. It's like the sheets are clean and the toilet flushes and everything. This place is awesome. It's top notch. And so my buddy and I were excited and we're sitting out in the entryway of this hotel, putting out the vibe, you know, trying to impress girls. And I had hair back then and everything. It was great. When all of a sudden a bus pulls up to the hotel and a bunch of smooth looking dudes start piling out of it. And well, who was it? It was the Cincinnati Reds and they were staying at our hotel. I was like, no stinking way. Now I've never been a diehard baseball fan, but if I had a team, it'd be the Reds. I have something with Cincinnati. It'd be the Reds. And at the time there were two players that I absolutely loved. One was an outfielder named Ron Gant. And the other guy was a guy that most people have never heard of named Deion Sanders. And so my buddy and I were out in the entryway and have I mentioned, we're just a tiny bit excited. It's like Neon, Dion, and us are gonna kick it and I'm gonna be friends with RG. And so anyways, the players are all coming in and I actually did get a chance to talk with Ron Gant and I told him about my deep love that I have for him. And I probably started following him to his hotel room because we're friends, right? But something I'll never forget and I kid you not, uh, he asked me if I was gonna go to the game the next night and we actually were. So I said, yes. And I, I, I asked him if he'd hit a home run for me and he replied and he told me that he would hit two. And now I don't wanna say that it was God, but again, I kid you not, he did. He had two home runs for me. How awesome is that? This week, I actually found the headline because I had a few doubters on our staff to prove it. But anyways, the team's all coming in and we're out sitting in the entryway trying to look all cool and like we're waiting for our Mercedes or something, even though my mom drove a Dodge Caravan at the time. Uh, when all of a sudden, Mr. Deion Sanders himself walks through the door. And when he did, my buddy and I, we actually didn't even move. All we did, we just sat there and we just started saying random things about him to each other. I was like, that's Deion Sanders. And my buddy's like, prime time. And I'm like, two sports, stud of Florida State, Defensive player of the year for the Niners, one of the single greatest athletes of all time. And as an eighth grader, I think I audibly started praying, Jesus, you can take me now because my life is complete. <laughs> but uh, seriously, in looking back, the hotel probably should have called the cops on us because I think they technically call it stalking. I think that's what it's technically called. But now going back to the book of John though, and how this all connects, and I promise as always it does, you guys are like, liar, it never does. Again, we're told that God became flesh, right? And that Jesus is born and he makes his home among us. And then a few verses later, it fast forwards the story and Jesus is now an adult. And one day there's this huge crowd of people that have gathered, there's this huge crowd. And when Jesus walks up to the crowd, when he gets closer, he walks by a guy 
named John the Baptist. And I love this. John just gives a shout out to everyone. And he's just like, people, behold, look, listen. If you don't know, this is the real prime time. I'm just saying a guy who's just walked up to us, you're going to want to check this guy out and listen to what John says about him. He says, this is the one who takes away the sin of the world. Again, John's just like, hey, crowd, maybe get your cameras ready. You know, get your sandals so he can sign it because this is Jesus. He invented sports or something. And again, he's the one who takes away the sin of the world. Now we hear a very similar thing in the book of, in the book of Matthew. Joseph has just found out that his soon to be bride, Mary, is pregnant. And we're told that he considers breaking off the engagement with her. And rightfully so, right? I mean, she's most likely going to show up on, a, on an episode of Cheaters. When all of a sudden, an angel of the Lord appears to Joseph in a dream. And the angel just says, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. Because what was conceived in her, it isn't from the UPS man. Instead, it's the Holy Spirit. And the angel goes on to say, and she will give birth to a son. And you are to give him the name Jesus. Why? Because he will save his people from their Sins. Again, this Jesus, the one who makes his home among us, we're told that he will save his people from their sins. Okay, so this is our focus for today, but now switching to us, I'm just guessing that some of us are here and we're thinking, all right, so I know the baby's name is Jesus. I, I, I know that part, but what in the world does it mean that he will save his people from their sin? I mean, I feel like I should know this, and I've, I've maybe heard it on a, on, a, on a sermon before. I've seen it on a billboard, but honestly, it just sounds completely old school and outdated. And so what does it mean? And better yet, why should I care that Jesus will save people from their sin? And to answer this, I'm going to first give us a Sunday school answer, and then I'll try and break it down a bit more later. So hopefully it'll make sense to everyone. And so first off, here's the Sunday school answer, and try to follow with me for a minute if you can. But as human beings, God has created us to have a relationship with him, a relationship with our creator, enjoying his goodness and his love and his, and his kindness and his peace. Before anything else, we're created and, and we're, we're wired, and we have this longing inside of us to have a relationship with with God, but starting with Adam and Eve, we've all, every last one of us have made mistakes, right? We've all done things that we know aren't okay. We've screwed up. We've done things that we just know probably aren't so pleasing to God. In Bible words, you could say we've all sinned. And one of the, one of the, the verses that all the Lutherans here will know is if we claim to have no sin, then we deceive ourselves to what? And the truth is not in us. So we've all screwed up. And I know for myself, you do not need to convince me of this truth whatsoever. This is one of the verses in the Bible that I'm like, uh, yes, because I know that I have definitely made mistakes. There's, there's no question about it. I mean, just talk with my wife and my kids and even my dog, Daisy, and they can give you a testimony of just how imperfect I am. And can I get an amen in the house of God? Please don't amen that one. But continuing on, we're told that as a result of our sin, not only is our relationship with God broken and we're separated from all that he is, his joy and his peace and so on, but we're told that the, the wages of sin, that the result, what we've earned, really the consequence of our sin is death. It's, it's spiritual death. It's the death of our souls. It's the death of our insides. And not just in this life, but also in the next. And needless to say, this is not a good thing. And I've shared this before, but before I became a Christian myself for the longest time, I, just, I honestly just thought that God and church and religion was nothing more than a cute made-up fairy tale for, for people who needed something to lean on. But when I, when I first started to believe that God might actually be true, I can remember thinking that I wanted a relationship with God, and I so badly wanted his kindness and his goodness in my life, but I also just knew that I, I know again, no one had to tell me, I just knew that I had made so many mistakes, and I had so many regrets, and I just, I just, had no, no, I just knew that I had wronged God, and it was just like I somehow knew that there was this a consequence or something that I deserved. No one had to ever tell me. I just wasn't sure what I could do to make things right with God. And yet, thankfully, thankfully, there is nothing we ourselves can do to make things right. And there is nothing that we can do on our own to make up for our sin. I mean, we can't make it right by our church attendance or by giving enough money away or by trying to do, we can't do so by trying to be perfect. We, we can't do so by trying to be a good person regardless of what culture might tell us. And I'm, I'm so thankful that it's not about being good enough. That sounds like a really nice thing and you're okay with God if you're good enough, but I mean, how, how good do you have to be? Like good like Mother Teresa and how many people do you need to help in order to be considered good? And like, is there a certain amount of, of Girl Scouts that you need to buy cookies from? And is there a, a certain amount of neighbors that you need to sh shovel snow for in order to be considered good? I mean, I just know for myself, 
between the things that I've thought and said and done and the amount of people that I've air punched in the face while taking a shower, driving my, 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 my car, by any standard, I just know that I am not good. And yet again, there is nothing that we ourselves can do to make things right on our own. And thankfully, this right here is where Jesus comes in and he's the one who will what? He will save his people from their sins. And what this means is that he'll not only free us from our past and he will not only make it possible for us to have a relationship with, with God, but he will also cover the whole death thing as well. Last verse, we're told that God demonstrates his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Jesus died. He paid the penalty of sin. This is where the cross comes in. Jesus died for us. Again, God became flesh. Jesus, the one who makes his home among us, we're told that he's the one who takes away the sin of the world, that he will save his people from their sins. And so that's a lot to take in, huh? And is everyone still awake out here and breathing? Now, I, I just got to be honest, this week as I was working on the message, I was tempted countless times to change the message. Because, I mean, normally during Christmas, we usually talk about things like joy and peace, and talking about saving people from their sin just feels a touch out of place, if I'm being honest, and a bit heavy. And yet, here in the midst of the Christmas story found in the Bible is, is God naming this baby Jesus. And the name Jesus itself translates as God is salvation. And as, and as it says, the, the name Jesus basically means the one who will save people from their sin. And, and so here's God making it pretty clear that this isn't just important to understand, but it's actually the heart of what Christmas is all about. And it's actually the very reason that Jesus has, has came. And so... That's one of the reasons I decided not to change the message this week is because it sounds like it's fairly important to, to God. And the other reason is because I just know that there are few things better in life than to simply know that we're forgiven by God. There are few things better in life than to know that we're forgiven of our past, forgiven of our regrets, of our sin, and even further, there are few things better than to know that we've been made right with him and that we're able to have a relationship with God. And I'm just guessing that there's some of us here today and we might need to hear this exact thing ourselves. I mean, one of the things that I never cease to be amazed by is, is just how long we'll hold on to things from our past. We'll do so for years. From as a kid, from college, from relationships from a few years ago, something we said, something we did, something we were a part of, something we allowed to happen something we're embarrassed about, something that was intentional or a complete mistake, something that the whole town knows about or something that not another soul knows and we, we'll just keep carrying it around with us and it's just this weight that we, we lug around through life and I also just know for myself, even just in looking back at this past year, I know I've had some not so pretty moments, if you know what I mean, how I've responded to my kids at, at different points, what I've said in certain conversations with people, how I've reacted to something or someone and I'm just guessing that I'm not the only one who, in looking back at even this past year, just cringes a bit, thinking about the decisions we've made, thinking about some of the stuff in our private life, or maybe there's a situation that we're standing in right now that is just messed up, to be, to be frank. The way that we're living, the things that we're doing, the person that we've become, we just can't believe it. And in just looking at all of this, things in our past and in our life as it currently is, it's just so easy to become filled with guilt and shame and brokenness be, because of it. And even if it's something that we enjoyed at the time, it just feels like we're that much further away from God. And as time passes, we just continue to get further and further and further away from him and all that he is, his goodness and his peace. Or, or maybe we're here and we've just accepted that this is the person that we're just always going to be. And we just allowed our current situation or a current struggle or one mistake we made years ago, we just allowed it to define our worth and our identity. And it's just like we've made our bed, we've, we've made our life, and now we can, we can lay in it, right? And yet, thankfully, once more, God became flesh. And this guy, Jesus, the one who makes his home among us, we're told that he takes away the sin of the world and that he'll save his people from their sin. Now, earlier, we gave more of a Sunday school answer what this means, but on a very basic level, this word save here can also translate to mean rescue. So what this means for us is that Jesus rescues us from our sin. It means that he 
is willing and able to rescue us from our past, that he frees us from carrying around our mistakes with us, that he releases us from our guilt and shame, and I mean that he's willing and able to pull us out of our, of our current situations, the ways that we're currently living and the things that we're currently doing. Again, Jesus rescues us. He saves us from our sin. Now, just to be clear, this doesn't mean that we may not have consequences for the things that we've done. Some of our choices and actions might impact the rest of our time here on earth. But what it does mean is that as we stand before God, we can know that before him our conscience is cleared and that trying to make things right with God is no longer needed and that our relationship with him is fully restored only because of Jesus, the one whose very name, Jesus, reminds us that he's the one who will save us from our sin. And now if we're here today and we're wondering how is all this possible, you know, we've maybe heard something else, but instead of trying to make things right on our own, instead of trying to clean ourselves up, instead of trying to be good enough for God, which is all impossible, all that God asks for us is that we'd re- receive the gift that he's offered to us in Jesus. As we said last week, an invitation that ex- that's extended to all of us, that we'd simply confess our need for Jesus and that we'd invite him into our lives. And invite him into our lives, it, it just comes by simply declaring, Jesus, I invite you in. And in the same breath, Lord, would you save me from my sin? Would you forgive me of my wrongs? Would you pull me out of any place that, that I shouldn't be in Jesus? I want a relationship with you. And so, Lord, would you, would you please come into my life and would you, would you make yourself at home within me? And so I want to say that, but I also just want to say that for those of us who've been following Jesus for years, I just want to say that if we're here and, and we've gotten ourselves off track or if we found ourselves in places that we'd never imagined, whether it was one poor decision that we made or a, a bunch of small decisions that led to something bigger, whether it's pride or greed, whether it's jealousy or or bitterness, whether we've just been so busy and we're focused on other things right now, regardless of what it is, if we're here, and we just know that we've walked away from the Lord today, I I just encourage us just to simply ask the Lord to come and rescue us once again, that we just cry out to him and we'd ask him to pull us out of the place that we find ourselves. And I know for myself, most times it it seems like like I wait until I'm completely buried. It just seems like... I wait till I'm at the very end of my rope before I cry out. And and so again, regardless of what it is, my prayer is that today we just ask him to come and rescue us. But at some point today, we just declare, God, would you just come and rescue me? Would you pull me out? Would Would you free me from this? Would you deliver me? Would you release me? Would you come and save me? Now, I, I can't put into words how excited I am about this upcoming week. But between our four physical campuses, we have 21 candlelight services. And starting Wednesday, the service will be going 24 hours a day at the online campus. More than any other time of the year, people are open and, and wanting to be invited to church. And I'm pumped and I'm honestly praying that we'd reach out and invite people like never before. That God would somehow, some way use us t- to rescue the people around us. That's just awesome to think that the Lord could use us this year. Now, wrapping things up today, one of the things that I'll, man, one of the things that I'll hear every so often from people when I'm out and about, every so often a person will randomly ask me to pray that they'll make it into heaven someday. Sometimes it just comes out of nowhere. Sometimes the person is joking and they say it off the cuff, you know, pray for me, pastor, yada, yada. But a few months back, there was a, a guy that I've known for the last couple of years now who when I first met him, he made it clear that he didn't want anything to do with God. And without me even saying anything other than asking and answering his question, what I do for a living, he made it, just made it clear that he didn't want to hear about, about religion from me. And it's a dude that's rough around the edges in every way possible and usually isn't very serious about anything, including his feelings. But one day we were talking And he randomly just said to me, he said, Adam, if something ever happens to me, I haven't always been the best person, you know. I haven't always been the greatest human being and whatever. If something ever happens to me, would you pray that I make it into heaven? And he was completely serious for a moment. He quickly shifted the conversation, but you could just tell that it was something that he had thought about and it wasn't just something he, 
he just randomly said it, something you thought about. Now, if you've been here very long, you know that I'm not much of a fire and brimstone preacher. And this is something I don't mention very often, but I fully believe it to, to be true is that one day we will all stand before God and we'll be asked to, to give an account of our lives. And from, from Jesus to Paul, from the book of Matthew to 2 Corinthians, we're told over and over again that at some point we will, we will stand before the Lord and he will judge us. And I'm not talking about standing before our neighbor or a coworker judging us who's got faults of their own and maybe should mind their own business. I'm talking about a perfect God, the one who created the heavens and the earth, judging us. And Isaiah, he's a God so holy, the angels cover their eyes because he's so good. And here's why I share this, because instead of getting to this place and standing before for God someday, and it's us trying to explain to him how much good we've done and how many old ladies we've helped cross the road and how much money we've given away and how often we've made it to church and whatever else, which we're told will never be enough again on our own. And there's nothing we can do to make things right. Instead of, of getting there and fumbling with our words, instead of trying to give the greatest persuasion speech ever, which will fail, instead of getting there like my friend, hoping that the prayers of someone else will help him. Here's the truth. If at any point we've chosen Christ in this life, if at any point we've invited him into our lives and began to follow him, in this moment, all we'll need to say is his name. All we'll need to say is Jesus. And as a result, instead of being judged according to our sin, instead of receiving death like we deserve, instead we'll be greeted and take it in by the Father to spend the rest, our rest of eternity with him. Not because we've earned it, not because we've been good enough, but only because of God's grace and his love and only because of Jesus. Only because of Jesus. One last time each Christmas, we're reminded that this baby, the one I can't believe it, I just can't believe it, the one who decided to make his home among us, we're told that he will rescue us. We're told that he will save us, his people, from their sin. Let's pray. Gracious Father, Heavenly King, we just come before you grateful today, thankful for who you are, so thankful that you've sent us Jesus, the one whose very name, God, reminds us that you save us from our sin. That might seem like this old school outdated thing that really doesn't mean anything for us, but actually it means everything for us. It means that you rescue us from our past, you free us from our guilt and shame. You rescue us from the circumstances we get ourselves into. God, it makes it possible for us to have a relationship with you. We're so grateful that an imperfect people like us can have a relationship with a perfect God like you. We're so grateful, God, that Whenever death comes near for us, that instead of being filled with fear, we can be excited about what's to come, Lord, not because of the life we've lived, but only because of your son, Jesus. We're so grateful for that. We're, we're just grateful that we're not judged according to our sin. We're not, we're not judged according to some random person who decides whether or not we're good enough, but we're, we're judged by, by you, a perfect God who's, who, sent us, who sent us Jesus. We pray all these things in your name. Amen.